morning and welcome to Sunday Story Hour, where we share real life stories of how human design has helped our guests know themselves on a deep transformative level. By knowing and trusting ourselves, we develop deeper, more honest relationships and unlock our true gifts. I'm Kathy Bashanko, and this week, my guest is Stefano Lazaro, the guest that didn't want to go live, I guess, unconsciously, right? Um, We've been trying to do this in many multiple formats where people could join us. And so we're recording this and then going to upload it um, afterwards because technology is fighting against us today. So, um, so Stefano is a five, one splenic projector, left angle cross of Clarion, and he's going to share all sorts of interesting parts of his story with us. And Stefano is a big part of my personal story. So just to give you a little reference, Stefano reached out to me when I had made a post about midway time-wise in my journey, but really when I was starting to first deep dive into what it means to be a projector. And he saw a post I did in a projector group and graciously reached out to me and gave me lots of information of what to do and lots of guidance on his own privately. And I am forever grateful for all your splenic projector wisdom over the years. So without any more ado, I'd love for you to um, just tell us a little bit about your your human design story, wherever you want to start hmm. with it. Okay. Um, I guess I'll start from, uh, I think the year was around 2014. I was uh, coming from a few years of uh, what I thought was kind of regaining my freedom after a 10-year stint in, uh, in London as a working guy, as a super working guy, uh, quite successful as well. But um, I made some wrong choices. You know, and, and I was running away from the aftermath of these choices. And I was really in a, a bit of a tight spot because although I was able to travel and film and create, I was not really inside. I was feeling like there's something missing. You know, there's something I'm not getting. And also I had these pressures from these trial and errors that I, that I had committed or that I had made uh, in this 10-year stint. Uh, namely, I lost uh, a house that I had bought with somebody and uh, I lost some money. I financed a film that I, my intuition had told me not to do, but there was an invitation I just didn't recognize. Uh, the essence of it. I was still looking very much at the exterior world. So anyways, I was uh, stuck and I really asked the universe uh, in a very determinated, if that's the word, in a very focused way to help me. And at the time, I was halfway or well, with it, well, in a project, a film project where I was um, filming a, a mature DJ in Ibiza uh, um, who, who had a very interesting life. And it was the story of uh, kind of a renegade, uh, a bit of a story of, of a loser, of a beautiful loser, just like me. So I went back to the island in the summer of 2015 to try and finish this film. And, and I, while I was there, I realized I, I hadn't filmed him for maybe a year. And things had changed. It shifted in his life. There was a lot of... Uh, kind of depression going on and uh, things that gotten serious. And we had become friends. 
in all of this time and around the five years that I was filming him. So um, I was again in a like, should I film this? You know, it started to feel, I mean, my friendship with him, obviously it got to the point where I started feeling for him and therefore as a subject matter, it was not really working, you know. Anyways, I was also amidst the, my own confusion as I've just tried to explain. And I asked that there was, we were all living in the subjects of a farmhouse in this beautiful, uh, magic, magic place in near San Carlos, the small village in the east side of the island, northeast side of the island. And, um, I confided into this other person who was living there. It was much older. They're both much older than me, 20 years old, older. And um, I, you know, I said, look, I'm really struggling. I don't know. Something's happening. I can't even put my finger on it. Uh, and he just said, ah, you should uh, try this human design story. Human design, you know, it really changed my life. And he gave me the contact of uh, someone who then became later on my teacher. His name is Jean-Philippe Godfolk, a Dutch reflector, 6'2", like you. And um, I kind of just put it there and because, I mean, although esoteric knowledge has always come to me, I've always been a bit shy or a bit timid or just... Uh, a bit fearful, I guess, because of some things that have happened much earlier in my life to delve into, you know, the unknown or what's not uh, kind of mainstream, let's say. So I left the island after a couple of weeks and I started researching about human design. And the first thing I noticed was that uh, this uh, Robert Allen Perkow or this Rafaela was uh, born on, we shared the same birthday and month, 9th of April. That kind of went ding, you know, a bit. And then he was also Canadian. And I've spent about four years of my life in Canada uh, during my university years. So, and I looked into it. There was some videos on YouTube and I kind of uh, raised my curiosity, let's say. Um, so I returned to the island in November, I think it was, or late, uh, late October of 2015. And, and I got in touch with Jean-Philippe and, uh, we did a reading and that, I mean, I wouldn't say like it shocked me or that it, you know, it told me things I didn't know, but it did actually put, uh, some kind of organization of how I worked or how my energy worked. And I, and I was able basically to understand my, myself a bit better. Um, and then while this was happening, I realized that the subject that I was filming was one of Ra's, I mean, he knew Ra very well. He hang out with him. And so were a lot of the people around this subject who I'd got to know because of the film that I was making. And so it was, you know, again, you know, these synchronicities happening and I was just kind of, okay, maybe this is, you know, there's something here. Right. And uh, between, and I had decided, I mean, I, I, I got a quite a lucrative gig at the time, uh, remotely. I was translating, uh, or subtitling uh, French films for a uh, Los Angeles company. And, uh, so that I could stay on the island and, you know, and pursue the film, try and finish this film, but also try and, you know, find more, find out more about this human design because of some of the things that, uh, Jean-Philippe had told me during the reading. And um, in the house at that point, the, the fellow who had 
initially suggested that I should look into this, I'd left. And uh, he was replaced by a much younger woman who was a hat maker. I forget that there's a specific term. A very a talented. A milliner? Uh, doesn't ring a bell, but could yeah. be. I mean, uh, Anna, another Anna von Kettel, who is not with us anymore. Mm. And uh, she was an Aries like me. And we struck a very, you know, very strong friendship. And she knew of Jean-Philippe and she knew where he was staying. So one day I asked her, I said, hey, take me over to, to where this guy is living. And the guy, and Jean-Philippe was at the time living in a cave, just uh, in a, well, there's a set of caves just uh, in front of a very famous or infamous place in, uh, in Ibiza called this Vedra. It's this rock that uh, has some uh, very strong magnetic pull. And uh, it's also a place that historically was known for either UFO sightings, but most importantly, uh, I think in the mid 80s or early 1800s, sorry, uh, it was a place where this monk had gone to kind of a hermitage various times and returning with the visions and kind of channeling stories which are not really well known so kind of a magic place let's put it this way and if you've been there or in front of it you do sense that there is something that's quite powerful um i've had mixed feelings in front of it i've gone there many times and sometimes it's felt like very feminine energy very warm other times it feels very kind of doom and gloom. Hmm. Right? So it's a very strong magnetic like rock. Do you feel well, like I don't know if, oh, if I mean I've never seen seen anything that suggests that. I just think oh, okay. that it's a place that carries a very strong magnetic field, okay. very strong pull. And he was living right in front of it in this cave and Every else to me, it was just crazy. You know? I mean, it was great film subject, you know, but I was, you know, really trying to figure, you know, see where that rabbit hole was going. Mm -hmm. So basically, I stayed with him and I asked him, you know, okay, hey, teach me this this thing called human design. Oh, there's a preamble. There's something I haven't said, which was quite interesting that happened on. Uh, between, I think it was New Year's Day. It was the 1st of January by that time. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I had gotten my reading, and I was kind of in between these two events that I've just said. And I was... Um, we went to a party. We couldn't find this New Year's party. It took us like... Uh, I mean, we got there really late. We, we left around 10, 30, and got there at 3 in the morning. So, or no, sorry, one o'clock in the morning. So it was, you know, a place that my film subject should have known and he couldn't find it. Anyways, we get there really late. Um, I had smoked some uh, marijuana at the party and I was also given uh, a dab of MDMA, which is, uh, I don't know what you call it, Molly, I think, or I don't know what's the street name in the States. Yeah, Molly, I think. Yeah. But it was in crystal form. It wasn't a pill and it was very little. I mean, just by, I, I just tried it. But by that time, kind of the party had died down and we all had to leave. So I kind of went back, uh, we went back home and I got into bed and um, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like uh, this mist materialized in front of me. I mean, while I was lying down. There was this cloud or it was more like mist just started emanating from <laughs> the ether. And that, you know, I was just thinking, oh, there I'm like, wow, this, this felt, it's really good, you know. But uh, it came into me, it actually went 
right into me. And it felt very warm. It didn't feel like some kind of, usually when there's entities or ghosts or uh, what I've now come to realize are just emotional imprints uh, in the quantum field, uh, you usually get very cold. And this was like a warm embrace. It was very feminine. It was like uh, a woman's uh, kind of energy. And I don't know if that any, had anything to do with what came later, but as soon as I started checking this human design, I, I kind of understood very quickly what it was all about. I mean, I'm not saying that I had some channel. I mean, I had to learn it, but it was very easy to understand. And... Um, and that's how I, I, I came to, to know human design. But then the story kind of changed because I went back to the film subject and uh, things started to get really weird between us. He was jealous of our friendship, of my friendship with Anna. And uh, it kind of got, you know, he was, I mean, he's a 3 five emotional manifester. Mm. So this is the, D, the DJ, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. So is it, I had to leave, you, basically. Sorry. You did make a film about him, though, right? Isn't that one of your... Um, I made the... There is a film I made something? where he's featured in it. Yeah, yeah he's okay. one of the main features, but it wasn't a whole film. It was a documentary. I was actually trying to make a film, well, a documentary film, just exclusively on him. And it never happened because yeah. that drive broke... Uh, Right. Yeah. I mean, if we get into my problem with the, the electromagnetic, that's why probably this hasn't, ha you know, happened to the mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm have, noticing a trend. I think it's part of the 10-3. The, the, I think there's something, there's some literature, but I might be wrong. But I, I did, uh, I think it's part of my 10-3, ten, ten you know, the behavioral. Uh, huh. Uh, the martyr, okay. the behavioral uh, aspect of the 10 in the martyr line. I think he has problems with, uh, with gear or hardware or material, something like that. I think I read it. I'm, I might be wrong, but anyways, uh, yeah. I've had it all my life. I've, you know, there's certain times where I just, for some weird reason, all the electricity, you know, shuts down or, well, someone Especially did when I'm really tense. I wasn't tense today. So right? Weird. You were pretty chill. Someone did post that it was something to do with the moon um, and Mars or something. And um, some, Mars opposing, um, Mars and the moon, are, I think, are opposing Uranus or something, which is supposed to be some sort of difficulty. So, I don't know. There's always... It's a recurrent theme in my life where, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was electrocuted as a child. Uh, really? yeah, I, I mean, I almost, <laughs> I remember being there for quite a while, but, um, while I was, uh, in my own bedroom, I put my finger on one of these, we used to live in a place that had, uh, um, anyways, it's not important. I just got electrocuted. But it is interesting because I have heard something about an experience between, or a connection between um NDEs, near death experiences and um psychic connection and abilities and that sort of thing. And and so I'm just curious, you know, if that might have something to do with um, you know, that whole connection with, you know, when the veil is so thin when you've almost crossed over that it when you come back, it brings in some sort of ability it's interesting. to connect with things so yeah so back um back to the whole human design thing so you were learning it from this guy who lived in a cave in ibiza who was friends with ra right yeah well i Did don't you? know how friend i mean you might have to interview him to see how well, he's he was. That familiar with ra he was an acquaintance oh yeah he was a student a i mean student of ra. okay he got the knowledge directly from ra and okay. he ah, he's an amazing fellow because if you meet him 
I, everybody around them, I, everybody around me was telling, oh, no, Jean Philippe, no, he's crazy. Lima, you crazy guy, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> everybody was talking dirt about him. And uh, soon, not so much to win the reading, although, you know, because I was kind of interested in what he was saying. But when I went to meet him at his place, there was this recognition, which I've had a couple of times in my life, where I really, like, I know you. I, you know, we've, you know. So there was this recognition from another lifetime. And, uh, and uh, what he had to say, I mean, in, he's such a wise and heartful person that I just, you know, bonded with him, you know, straight away. Um, so yeah, I went back to the, uh, and after this, uh, event at the cave, I went back to the house and I basically to cut a long story short, I had to leave. I couldn't stay there. anymore. And, uh, I asked some friends if they knew of a place that I could stay. And basically I hit a jackpot because, um, they had this, uh, they had just renovated an old farmhouse right in the middle of Ibiza that they were going to turn into a holiday place and retreat center. Uh, it's named, it's still there. They don't have it anymore, but it's called Casa Corazon. And they needed uh, somebody to keep the fire going because the fire was connected to the heating system. And so they offered me basically free rent or, you know, free, free accommodation in this amazing seven bedroom uh salt uh, water swimming pool uh right in the middle of the most uh the richest land that you have in Ibiza in terms of soil it's very rich the soil right in the middle of the island and as soon as i got to this place i remember dreaming this place mm. so again things started to get really magical and it was during this period that uh, basically I had enough privacy and the time to really, you know, dig my teeth into into this uh, into this system. So that's that's how it started. And so, then, yeah. So that was. Um like 2015 by then, right? So no, it was 2016. It was the winter. Okay, at that point, okay. We had crossed over to 2016, okay. and then I think it was in the spring of 2016. I was asked because of my English skills and mostly, but because I guess I given these people a good impression, they asked me if I could manage the place for them during the summer. Oh, nice. So I had kind of like an inn to stay on the island, which is what I wanted. Uh, Ibiza is a very difficult place to live on for for year round because of you know it's just a seasonal place. So if you know it's very hard to make a living 12, 12 months a year. Yeah. So I accepted, and uh, um, I started uh, following Jean Philippe to night events across the islands, not every day, but, you know, a couple of times a week. And I started doing my own kind of mini readings, you know, very basic stuff, kind of energy type and uh, authority, you know, profile, this sort of thing. And uh, I liked it. Yeah. You know, I, I all of a sudden I realized that uh, vocationally, I was much more happy in trying to help people find themselves because, I mean, although this has happened in my life as a recurrent theme, you know, it was always kind of not too, not too deep or part of me was afraid of it. And I mean, if you look at my design, I've got a reflector personality. So. Yeah. I and usually that that says that it's going to take a long time to figure yourself out. See, I've got if the somebody reflector doesn't body. tell you. I have the reflector yeah, body. There you go. I mean it's and if you have a reflector 
story going. I mean, it's yeah. Unless somebody explains it to you, then uh, I mean, for years I was just oh, oh, yeah, that looks good. Let's go there. You know, oh, nice, and you know, just getting carried sideways. My personality is a self-projected projector. The only conscious channel I have is the one eight. So I often find that I process like a self-projected projector. So, okay. So I want to um, just talk about, you know, having this, you know, you've had a very unusual life um, and we all have, right? We've all had our dip, you know, on the surface, everybody can look away, but most of us have a lot of different things that, but as a five, finding out you are a projector and a fifth line, um, <clears throat> And finding all that out on the, a magical human design place like Ibiza, I'm wondering um, how that affected your ability to like really understand yourself. Did you feel like that gave you like profound insights, or did you already know those things about yourself? As I said, I knew everything he told me. I knew. I even knew that I could only eat at night, or that I liked to eat at night. I mean, I've always known these things. I mean, my intuition, my, uh, there's a voice that speaks. And, you know, the problem is that with an open, when my, I've got a completely open mind, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you're in that game, you know, you're in the mind game, whether you like it or not. If somebody doesn't explain to you, look, your mind's great for picking up things and then re waiting to release them to others when you're asked to. Yeah. I think in general, anybody who is very open, regardless of which energy type, uh, it's a difficult task because, you know, you just don't have a lot <laughs> that's consistent about you. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean that I did, it didn't, you know, awake, you know, it, it did give me a little dingy dingy because basically I started uh, to learn to relax because... You know, and this is an advice for all projectors. There's very little you got to do is just start to relax and get out of that buzz. Yeah, right. I mean, it's different for you, I guess. I don't know because you know you're you're. A, if I remember, you're a triple split, correct? Yes. Yeah, they, yes. So you, I'm triple. So you have three split. motors. You bridge my splits, so just so you know, we're ah. single split. And I was just sitting here thinking, oh, isn't it interesting? Because you're in Rome, so you're it's already evening there, so it's getting dark. And you're indirect light, and I'm direct light, and it's daytime and sunny here, so we're in our correct... We're in the duality. Right, in our <laughs> duality, and and then you bridge my, all my splits. And um, But what's really... This is what I was thinking, you know, kind of contemplating before we got on and started having all of our technical problems, was how comfortable I feel with you, because... It's an interesting dynamic because you bridge all my splits, but you do not define any new centers for me. So I feel very much at ease because I feel like I know who I am in a way that feels recognized. It feels like it can flow. And then that made sense when I looked at that and I was like, yeah, well, there's not some new definition that is something I'm not used to. There's just a connection between the centers that I already know in a way that feels really, feels really good. But you and I have no electromagnetics and we have no um, companionship channels. We just have compromise dominance and, and compromise. dominance. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting to think about. And one of the dominance is you have the 1057 and I just hit or not dominance when the compromise I have the 57 and you know your splenic I have a defined spleen but I'm not that's not my authority and I'm only in the last couple of years really coming to understand my intuition on any way shape or form right I haven't trusted it I haven't really even had enough belief in it to look for it and recently i'm becoming aware of that of that ability but you know when i'm with some you know in your presence where you have that full channel there is this little bit of like you know splenic envy intuition envy that comes up then it's interesting to see how that is in the chart as well you know so you're not alone i mean it's uh 
I mean, my spleen's always been talking to me, but I've only started to really listening after I got my reading. So, it's, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the beautiful things about human design is it can kind of really just point us towards ourselves, right? But one of the things you and I talked about when we touched base before this is about how human design is kind of a doorway. It's not the only doorway. It's not the doorway. Um but it is a doorway, but it's not a destination, right? We're not like once we like, you know, there's more to more to do to find yourself. Well, it depends on sorry. Yeah, oh, interrupting you. I okay. understood what you were asking. Um I think it depends. It depends on who you are and you know, I mean for me as a I mean, you know, if I have to ask myself what it is, what is it that you want to do? And I also, so this question is obviously become much more important now that I have a better sense of the projection field of what comes to me in general. And I mean, I'm now in a position where I work as a creative director, freelance creative director through Amore Films, but I'm also a counselor. And the counseling that I do involves a lot of people with... Uh, quite advanced cancer or quite advanced mortal, uh, what I like to call bio activations, but situations where there's a life and death story or uh, people that suffer from depression, not knowing, you know, things that can really be fixed very quickly especially with human design. I mean, you can tell them a good story about themselves, but then, and I'm still learning, I'm still investigating. I feel that I need much more knowledge or a much more strong, or a stronger foundation in order to really be of help. So I've looked beyond human design. I've looked into, I mean, I started looking into new German medicine in my 30s. I'm now 50 years old. Mm, when, yeah. uh, when I got really sick, 27 years old, I got really sick for over, over a couple of years. I had the, what felt like a, like a thorn in my head, like, like a knife being put in my head. And it also had repercussions. And I figured out after about a year, because it, it lasted for a year and a half, and a year into the, and it was daily, this constant pain. I mean, what you call, I guess, a migraine or, or, but it had, it had different, you know, I, I got exams done. I had to stop work. I had to come back to Italy. I was in London. I had to come back to Italy and kind of really go into timeout mode for a year and a half to try and figure out what was happening. And I found out what was happening, not definitely through normal, uh, the conventional medicine story because they just couldn't, you know, understand why I had a stomach ulcer and, and then this, it just didn't make any sense to them. But I did figure it out through the five biological laws of uh, new German medicine, Dr. Hammer. Yeah. I'm familiar with it, but if anybody yeah. isn't, they can Google it. Or oh, you should, it. because that's because it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Well, you can understand the the physiological, biological process of uh, what we call disease, which is already the wrong word, really. So, yeah. yeah so I'm, you know, furthering and furthering the investigation, basically be moving beyond human design. And that is not to say that I don't use human design or I don't think it's. Right. Uh, sure. I think some of the language. We spoke about this, you know, a few times. I think uh, some of the Ra's language or Ra's style, yeah, uh, is a bit. Uh, uh, it's not to my liking or not to my taste, but you know. Yeah, sometimes it uh, gets a little. Um, it's you know, dark. I, yeah, it's dark. It comes from a dark place. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, people can, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to get into that because it's yeah. just uh, I'm going to sound like criticizing when it's not it's just my own observation you know based on my subjective preferences um, 
and yeah, and I and I definitely have found that the um the the words we use matter, and we started to talk about that and how um if you're in fact you had some sort of experience about words. I don't know if you feel right. Wasn't there something? Well, just recently, yeah, this summer I had a uh, very strong. Uh, well, it was a. Uh, I don't know what's the word, but I took uh, some mushrooms basically. And uh, in Ibiza, and uh, well, I took a chocolate that was that had psilocybin in it, or right. Uh, I, I think it was that because it uh, it kind of gave me an hallucination with sound. That be the basically, but it wasn't a voice; it was my voice. You know, I, I didn't feel coming it from the outside; it felt coming from within. Okay. But it was all about how, how sound, and it's this is very well known. I don't think I discovered anything uh, that's not out there. I mean, the experiments of, um, I think it's Emoto, the Japanese guy who did the experiments with water, the yeah. memory of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It mm -hmm. was very much along those lines whereby, you know, whatever you think and the words that you use for yourself and for others have an effect and can, it can be a healing effect and a detrimental effect. And, uh, I mean, it, to explain it now would take quite a bit, but so that, that was the gist of it. So yeah. basically, you know, uh, be careful what you say, be careful what you think, because it does happen. <laughs> right. And it's funny cause I have been very conscious of it, but I still find myself making jokes. Um, sometimes and then catching myself going no i don't want to say that because even as a joke you know um words have power the, you know the two and i know you know this but i'm just saying it for saying it is the two most powerful words in the um english language are the words i am because whatever you say afterwards you're giving energy to your to the manifestation or creation or reinforcement of that and so that's been really um, powerful for me. And that's part of why, as much as I do value some of the teachings and um, traditional human design that she doesn't bring into her stuff, I really love the language in the quantum human design stuff. And Karen Curry Parker is now Dr. Karen Curry Parker. She just got her doctorate and she did her dissertation on the effects of our story and the way we talk about it on our immune system. So she had people, they had people tell a story. I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but um, the gist of it was she had people tell a story of what um, something that had happened to them that was a disempowering story. And then they measured some immune markers in the blood. I forget exactly what the science of it was, but there was something they could measure and they got that number and then they worked with those people and they had them do some exercises um, where they rewrote the narrative of that, where they either learned a valuable lesson or they even a fictitious version where they emerged as the victor in the story and did something where they changed the language. Then they measured that immune response again after they told this new story and it was like 40% higher in this marker in their immune system. So you know, we, we really, the way we talk about ourselves and about our life um, is super important in our overall health. And it's easy to not realize where we're still the victims in our own story. And I will all of a sudden one day just be like, oh yeah, I'm still telling, I'm still not necessarily even telling it, but thinking about it from the story of, you know, I'm a victim of this sort of thing or that sort of thing. If you, whereas when you switch that, I think it is huge. So, but getting back to your story, it's really interesting to hear you talking about um, all of this from the place where it originated, right? In the whole um, island of Ibiza, which for people who only know of Ibiza from what, you know, having heard of it, because of human design. I mean, Ibiza is a pretty hardcore party tourism island, right? I mean, that's mainly what a lot of people go yeah, there for of, this. Um, yeah, but a lot of people go there to find themselves through, right. you know, strong, you know, 
look, Ibiza, like every other place, I think I wrote about it somewhere. I forget where, but it's, uh, you see both sides of the coin. Okay. Except that in Ibiza, it's very much amplified because it's a small island in the winter. At least when I was living there, it was around 110,000 people. I think the, the numbers have gone up quite, quite a lot. But uh, you see the duality and, you know, you see the black and white, you know, you see the hardcore partying, but you also see, you know, uh, I've met uh, some of the nicest and, you know, uh, less complex, contrived people, you know, in Ibiza. Yeah. So it's, it's you see both, but it's known for that, obviously, because that's the attraction. That's where the big money is. Also, Ibiza historically was the poorest of all the Balearic islands. Mm. So you have to think that genetically, you know, uh, the people, the Ibizenkos, the people from there, they only started seeing kind of money during the second wave of the hippie movement you know in the 70s mm-hmm. so there is still a lot of greed in the blood let's put mm-hmm. it this way but i've also met the the other side you know i've also met the heart so it's um i mean for me it, it's a place that uh, i've always been attracted to initially for that initially because it was a party place you know go there in the summer spend two weeks from going from one party to another meeting girls you know project their ah, feeding on the sacral energy you know right but uh, i can tell you that lasted very you know that that kind of <laughs> Fun lasted very little because as soon as I, start, I just started moving in the island, I felt like, wow, this place is, got, wow, you know, every, you know, the right. nature and, you know, I started getting much more interested in, in the natural aspect of it. And what moved me to go back was actually the, when we made the, the Binge in Ibiza documentary, it was all about, let's go and find out why people, creative people move there. Yeah. You know. Okay. And um I will in the the notes on this, I'll put a link to your website because I know you have sure. you those videos Thank and you. some blog posts and stuff on that. And um and it's very interesting. And so but now you're um you're mostly in you're in Rome full time now, right? I'm at the moment I'm in Rome. Um uh, I'm taking this time uh, to investigate, to solidify my foundation. Uh, cause I think, I mean, I, I already work with medical groups and, you know, obviously people who are much more skilled than I am. I'm getting into a bioresonance project, uh, working with the doctor there and I need to up my game. Basically, I'm going to get a certification and it's a, you can only practice within a health uh, within the health sector if you have uh, either a doctor or a naturopath certification. So I'm getting that um, deepening my knowledge of the five biological laws. I'm still studying human design. I mean, I'm still, mm-hmm. you know, I'm always looking into you know, more depth, although I'm starting to realize, and I think this is, you know, just coming into my Kiron that less is more and meaning that the more I know, the less my intuition, I'm not saying actually works, but it's like, now I get to a point where somebody talks to me and depending on the sound of their voice, I'm really able to see, sometimes even see what's happened to them. Yeah. You know, if I close my eyes and I use my inner vision, uh, something happens. I start between the sound and the inner vision. I start to actually see the event that I've made them, that I've activated them biologically. Now, have you found that you um, are... 
are only seeing the events from, because I know you are a believer in past lives affecting us. Yeah. So do you feel that your visions are all of this life or do you see like what people are bringing <laughs> in from past lives or? <laughs> no, I don't think it's, I think it's more linked to the psychological of this life. Uh, in dreams, and I'm studying now also another thing which I haven't mentioned, which is important, is that I've met somebody here. He's an 82-year-old uh, emotional manifester, 1-4. His name is Umberto Di Grazia. He's uh, very well known in Italy, but he also had uh, some international success in his younger age, in his younger years. He dreamt of Ronald Reagan's assassination and led, he was in the military and he, he, he got that message through much earlier, a couple of months before it actually happened. And uh, they didn't believe him and then it happened. And so they called him up and asked them to join a group of, uh, of scientists or psychics that uh, started doing work on, you know, out of body experience, remote viewing, et cetera, et cetera. And I wouldn't say I'm studying under him, but because one, four, five, one is a difficult and also manifest the projector. It's a difficult, uh, you know, relationship. I mean, it doesn't feel like, uh, organic it feels like you know there's times when i'm feeling his emotion and it doesn't feel right and there's this this very powerful energy and obviously i'm not going to tell him anything about right. him being a manifester because he's gone beyond that i mean right. i think but he's uh making me understand the power of dreams how to control dreams how to control uh myself in the dream you know and also um, how to use uh, visualization to heal, to go beyond the word and to actually trick the mind by, by basically drawing hearts and flowers everywhere. But don't call them hearts and flowers because right. the moment you do, the mind kind of forgets the frequency of love and I mean, it, we could be here <laughs> for hours trying to explain what right. he's teaching, but it's kind of, I'm absorbing it most of the times. And yeah. there's a lot of physicality in the work. You know, there's a lot of physical exercises. It's not just the uh, logical kind of studying. It's much more involved. And basically what I hope to do is at some point to have this bag of tricks, you know, this toolbox that's, you know, very well assorted and powerful in order to, well, I'm going to use the words of Jean-Philippe, you know, in order for those who come to me that I can tell them about themselves. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's one of the things I have really always felt from you is this real willingness to tell me about myself in a way that was very, um, even when you didn't know me at all, very like just, just a little bit, not too much, not overwhelming and with great love, right? It always felt there was this like sense of support in there that just has always felt really beautiful and i do um yeah, thank really, you that's really I, nice of you i do really appreciate that and how that has supported me on this whole um journey and i know there were times where i was deep in my head on trying to intellectualize the whole human design process and i would like message you with these convoluted questions <laughs> and i could just tell like in hindsight i like that i mean i've little... got an open edge nine i'm also it's my binary you know, so I love stimulation. I love, you know, to keep the mind right stimulated. So yeah. please feel free, you know. Yeah. So um so I'm wondering, you know, just before we wrap things up, because I know that we got started super late and you have um people and 
waiting for you. So um, I want to thank you for your patience, but I'm wondering if there's anything that you feel that you would like to say to whoever needs to hear it, whether it be listening. Nice. Hmm. Okay. This is uh, for everyone, but definitely for projectors or for open sacrals in general. I think that one of the, I wouldn't say quickest, but one of the easiest ways to get into your non-energy uh, open sacrals, not manifestors, but it applies to everyone really, um, is to follow your PHS. Try and figure out the way that you take in food, the way that you take information, because uh, that made a real difference for me. I mean, I'm an indirect being, so I'm on a perma Ramadan. You know, I only eat at night. And uh, I'm on a passive chain, so obviously I don't need a lot of food, a lot of nutrients to, you know, get going. And that's helped me relax into my form. It's helped me relax into my openness. Hmm. Especially for very open designs, I think that that's kind of, I wouldn't say the fastest, but the easiest way to get in touch with that part of you that knows who you are and what you're doing. And what do you say to somebody who's, um, I'm thinking of someone in particular who is consecutive, no, alternating, alternating. Well, that the way does that not I... resonate at all to them on as far as food mm. goes. They are very. We can both see where alternating is very much. Is it alternating or consecutive that they are, whichever it is. Um, well, if they're they're one. The they're on the same. It's one's. Uh, I think consecutive yeah. is left and uh, left variable. Well, yes, then there it's consecutive. Is, they're is they're quad left. This person is quad left. So. Um, so, but they're, you know, as far as taking information, they're very much, a, I do things completely devoted and then move to the next thing and doesn't have to be finished, but they don't try to focus on multiple things. So that part feels very correct to them. But the food, the consecutive eating one thing at a time does not at all resonate. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, that's a difficult one because, you know, how much of that is mind, you know, how much of that is a mind story? Is their time of birth right? Because again, these, these nuances of human design are very much linked to your exact time of birth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different variables in that. Uh, my question would be, how long have you tried to eat consecutively? Meaning just eat. Well, this, this person is a manifesting generator and they are very in touch with their sacral and very intuitive and their sacral just says no. So they've never experimented because their sacral is like, no, I'm not going to eat that way. She should send me a, a, a snippet of her hair, of her hair. Yeah. And we can put it in the machine with a picture of her. I mean, it'd be. If she could, you know, come to to the clinic or to the place where we do this, we could figure out if that's the exact birth time. You can figure out the exact birth time in your clinic. Well, it looks like, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've got enough data through DNA, though, through the hair. We, a friend of mine who is actually here can do it from... Uh, uh, biomagnetist uh, technique of testing your ankles and the response of the quantum field to his questions about time. And he's been pretty precise, but it much depends on on how he's doing that day. Yeah. On, you know, if he's, emo if he's that upset, he, I mean, machines yeah. don't have emotions, so they're right. dang, you know, right. they're precise. But we've noticed that with the, uh, with the body there, with the pre, uh, the the person on the carpet and hooked up to the machine, 
the reading is very reliable. Uh, with pictures taken with phones, meaning digital pictures, that reliability is not there. But we did find reliability with the, with the hair sample. Huh. Okay. Uh, name, surname, hair sample, cool. a picture just, uh, you know, to have a, right. a visual reference. Okay. And, so I know, yeah. you, I know you need to run. So if somebody wanted to connect with you on any of these things that we've talked about, is that something you're open to? And if Absolutely. so, how, how would they best reach out to you? Um, you put I did through comment. Facebook. I mean, okay. Do although I don't know how long I'm going to be on the socials. Okay. I find them a bit, uh, it's a bit uh, of a distraction. Yes, very much. I might shut down for a bit, okay. uh, but definitely either through Facebook or through my email. Okay. And what's your email? Or are you comfortable giving that here? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll contact at A-M-O-R-F-I-L-M-S dot org. Okay. Contact okay. at amorefilms.org. Okay, awesome. And that goes directly to you. Great to me. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your um, patience on all of the problems we've had, and I very much have enjoyed um, this conversation. And well, I hope, uh, yeah, that it's uh, it's really weird for a splenic. It's just, I don't know that I say the right thing. I mean, if I start thinking about what I say, it's just going to go sideways. I, so hopefully it was, hopefully it, it was all, good. Yeah, it was good for people to get some gist. I'm sure it was good for who it was supposed to be good for and not good for. Yeah, absolutely. Who, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Because, yeah. um, you yeah, know, yeah. You it's just mental. Can't change who we are for what somebody else. Uh, yeah, is, yeah. Right. It was very good for me. I very much enjoyed it and um, hope that we can speak again soon. But I, I will. Just, Absolutely. I want to um, wrap it up by saying every week we share stories of how my guests have come to understand themselves in a more loving and empowering way through the lens of human design. How you think and speak about yourself matters. Human design can show you the reframe of not only your own story, but the story you tell um, about your relationships. If you're ready to start living a better story, I'd love to help guide you. And to work with me as a mentor, you can set up a free discovery call at kathybashanko.com. It's just my name as it's written on the screen here. And, um, or you can DM me through Facebook or Instagram. And I would see you next week and hopefully next time we will be live.